morning. Imagination, I'm a big fan. So was Albert Einstein, who famously said, imagination is more important than knowledge. Our Presbyterian system puts a premium on imagination when it poses the question to anyone being ordained, will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? And at the same time, there are biblical texts that are so rich, they stretch my imagination like a rubber band to the breaking point with the lovely, wonderful truths that they're espousing. Today's text, for me, is one of those texts. Though I've read it many times as I was meditating for it for this occasion, I was struck with how the truths it espouses are so lush, I felt pushed beyond what my imagination could even take me. Maybe it'll strike you like this. As we prepare to hear the word of God, will you pray with me? Lord, would you give us single-minded focus today as we peer into your word? Would you silence all voices except yours, that we might receive the message you have for us today? Open the eyes of our hearts, that we would see more clearly the grandeur of who you are, and understand more fully how you would have us respond. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Hear the word of God. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through, his, through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of God from Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. For this reason, Paul begins, which begs the question, for what reason? for all the wonderful truths he's just been expounding on in the first two chapters of this book, all about what God has done for us in Christ, for the litany of spiritual blessings that we have in Christ in chapter one, we're chosen, adopted, forgiven, redeemed, included, sealed with the Spirit, given a glorious inheritance, etc., etc., etc. After he gets done with that, he can't help himself. He has to launch into prayer, praying that the believers might be awakened to this vast display of God's grace towards us. And then in chapter two, he steamrolls ahead with further elucidation of how God has ingeniously made a way for us to be delivered from the darkness into which our sinful nature has consigned us and created a way by which alienation and hostility can be replaced by reconciliation, not only between us and God, but among each other. You know, in the light of this past week's news cycle of the horrors that are taking place in the Middle East, we can be tempted to think that Paul is just a little out of touch with the way it really is. God creating Jew and Gentile into one new humanity? You've got to be kidding. It sounds impossible to us, given what we've had assaulting our eyes and ears. And yet, without minimizing the utter tragedy that is unfolding, what if... In the big scheme of things, Ephesians is alluding to an even deeper undercurrent, a more mysterious reality that relativizes even the most intractable enmities, a reality unleashed through the cross and resurrection, a supremely ultimate power that by comparison dwarfs all other lesser powers. Christ himself is our peace with a capital P, Paul boldly proclaims, the one in whom warring factures are reconciled. This creator word made flesh through whom human nature can be recreated from the inside out. Such wondrous truths again drive Paul to his knees in prayer, though the normal prayer posture was actually to stand up, which just tells you how earnestly he felt about what he was praying about for them. Believers, do you know what you have in Christ? Let me pray it into you. 
savor it. And with that, Paul proceeds to test the limits of our imagination by rolling out three incredible truths. Mind-boggling truth number one. We as believers are indwelt by the one through whom the cosmos was created. You might say, oh yeah, yeah, I know that. No, no, no. Let's linger here. Let's get a sense of the magnitude of this. Consider these scientific examples. Did you know that our sun is but one of an estimated 100 to 400 billion stars, and that's just in our own galaxy, of which the scientists estimate there are two trillion galaxies also out there. How about this? If the sun were the size of a typical front door, the earth would be the size of a nickel. <laughs> or this, did you know that one million earths could fit into our sun? And finally, did you know that there are way more stars in the universe than grains of sand on the earth? Do you suddenly feel a headache coming on? <laughs> My brain hurts thinking of that. Doesn't that give us a renewed appreciation and awe for this first truth that Paul has just set before us? We are indwelt by the one who stands before all of that cosmic splendor that I've just touched upon. He invented it. He brought into being all things out of nothing. The Gospel of John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and through Him all things were created. And then he drops down to chapter 14, and it says, This Creator Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and now He comes to dwell within us. And the Greek word here is not that He comes and sort of spends the night temporarily lodging with us to, before He moves on. It's He settles in permanently, permanent residence within us. And notice that Paul prays that we might be strengthened with power through the Spirit in our inner being so that Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith. And you say, why is the Spirit's power necessary for Christ to dwell? Well, if you look at Romans 8, verses 10 and 11, it gives us a clue. Before we came to faith, we were controlled by our sinful nature. But the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead, awakens us to faith and now raises us out of the deadness of our captivity to that old nature, breaking its compulsive power and deadly stranglehold over us so that we can come under new management and enjoy the glorious freedom and joy that Christ who indwells us now imparts to us. The Spirit enlivens us and gives us the power to resist sin and relinquish control to the rightful Lord of our lives, our loving Savior who sacrificed everything to set us free. Mind-boggling truth number two. We are deluged with Christ's love. When Christ takes up permanent residence in us, we become rooted and established in love and Paul is drawing on botanical and architectural imagery here. We become like a tree solidly anchored by its roots. And here's an amazing fact I bet you've never heard. <laughs> you might expect the root system of the tallest trees in the world, the redwoods in California, they're all at about 300 feet tall. You might expect the root systems to be equally that deep into the earth. But the reality is, they are only about 6 to 12 feet deep. So what keeps those trees from toppling over? Their shallow roots intertwine with the roots of all the other redwood trees that are growing in close proximity, so they not only share the nutrients, they physically support each other. If we could see beneath the surface, we'd see roots like a massive interlocking mesh of root systems. They literally hold each other up, those trees. What does that say about the power of interconnectedness to provide strength, stability, mutual care, let alone does it attest to the sheer genius of the creator who invented that? We are also likened to a tall building built on sturdy bedrock that ensures that it will not be prone to collapse. What powerful images to drive home the point that Christ's love not only satisfies us emotionally, but stabilizes us, makes us resilient so that we can withstand calamitous forces from the storms of life whenever they lay siege. And furthermore, Christ's love is not only stabilizing, it is incalculably immense. 
it seems as if Paul is struggling for the words to describe this magnitude. You know, quite often when we're trying to describe an object, we describe it in spatial terms. Well, it's, it weighs this much, it's, it's this high, it's yay wide. But how do you describe Christ's love in such terms? It defies spatial dimensions. It cannot be contained even by our deepest mental concepts that we conjure up to try and box it in. It is deeper, wider, higher, broader, more fabulously extensive and ingenious than anything we can imagine. Just think of it. Why, who would invent a God who is so unfathomably almighty and yet who willingly takes the posture of a lowly servant, subjecting himself to abuse, rejection, a torturous death at the very hands of the ones he lovingly created, all for the sake of love? that he might retrieve and receive them into his forever family. Who would make up such a seemingly weak God? What wondrous love is this? Rightly asks that famous Good Friday hymn. What wondrous love indeed. And paradoxically, Paul prays that we would know this love that surpasses knowledge. How can that be? How can you know something that's beyond knowing? One scholar puts it this way, we can know God truly, but never exhaustively. St. Augustine offers a similar thought. If you think you understand God, it would not be God. <laughs> it doesn't mean that we can't know anything about God. What God has chosen to reveal himself, of, of, of himself about us, we can know, reliably so. But our finite minds will always fall short of complete understanding of an infinite God. That just makes sense. But though total comprehension of God will always elude our finite grasp, knowing God's love experientially is within our purview. And yet here again, even in human terms, can we ever plumb the depths of a human person? Are persons so absolutely predictable that anything novel or uh, unexpected is impossible? Relational knowing always leaves some room for freedom to act in exceptional, untypical, even surprising ways. And if that's so on the human plane, how much more so for God? One final observation, did you catch it? Paul prays that we might have the power together with all the saints to grasp this boundless love of Christ. It's communally grasped. We need each other's insights and experiences, not only from those of us who are living, but even the spirit-led believers that came before us. We need each other to help us discern God's ways and learn how to live faithfully to face the challenges of our day. Just like the intertwined root system from those surrounding redwoods that works together to support those hefty trees, so our connectedness within the community of faith is vital it's integral to flourishing and maturing as God's people. Finally, mind-boggling truth number three. We are filled with the fullness of God. What a statement. But it's not an overstatement. Colossians 2.9 tells us, in Christ, all the fullness, not just 30%, 20%, 50%, all the fullness of God dwells in him bodily and... We have been given fullness in Christ. Do the math. If we are in Christ, in whom the fullness is, the fullness of God, of God is in us as well. We are given entree into the very life and love of the eternal triune God. And yet, Paul has already alluded to that earlier in chapter 2. Through him, Christ, we have access to the Father by the Spirit, that wonderful Trinitarian truth. And Jesus, before he's arrested, even prays in a similar way. Father, just as you are in me, and I am in you. I pray that they, referring to his disciples and all other disciples to come, including us, may they be in us. We get to participate in the Son's communion with the Father by the Spirit. How glorious is that? You know, to be clear, it doesn't mean that we become divine and cease to be human, or that we no longer need to grow in our faith, but rather it means that we are given the unimaginably gracious gift of being filled with as much of the fullness of God as we in our human limited creaturely capacity can accommodate. 
all the while continuing to mature in our faith as we yield ourselves to the transforming work of the, of, of the Spirit within us. How earnestly Paul prays that we might embrace and live into that fullness that we already have in Christ. George Walton, a collector of rare coins, came into possession of what he figured might just be a very rare Liberty Head nickel, bearing the date 1913. When the Liberty Head nickel was discontinued after 1913, it was replaced by the Indian Buffalo coin, and the U.S. Mint, for some reason, still held on to those old dyes, even though they never used them again, until about five years later, an enterprising, or maybe we would say self-seeking employee, surreptitiously got hold of those dyes and created five of those now obsolete Liberty Head nickels, one of which found its way to George Walton in 1945, which he cherished and kept in his collection. Well, when Walton died in 1962, his estate was assorted, sorted out, and though the nickel was taken by his nephew Ryan and taken to various auctioneers, nobody seemed all that impressed with it. So Ryan, perhaps in honor of his uncle, posed, passed the seemingly worthless nickel on to his mother where it stayed in her house, left to collect dust for 40 years. When she died, the coin collecting community, having gathered four of those five nickels, went in search of that last obsolete Liberty Head nickel. And Ryan, thinking on a hunch, maybe there's something to this, decided to give it one more time and had it assessed. And he was bowled over by what he found. The valuation came to $2.5 million. His mother had it in her possession for decades, up until her death, never knowing the exorbitant treasure she possessed. I can just imagine Paul fervently asking all who heard his letter, do you know? Do you know the unfathomably rich treasure you have in Christ? Do you know the spiritual fortune that has been given to you? He's thus stretched our imagination by reminding us that the sovereign, eternal Lord who created and sustains the cosmos has personally come to take up personal residence in all the hearts of those who trust him. He's challenged us to try and wrap our minds around the limitless love of God that has been extravagantly lavished, the depths of which we can never completely fathom. And finally, he blows our mind by telling us we can be filled not just with a little measly portion, but the fullness of God. We can be filled with the fullness of God. What a contrast to the deceptive lie that often circulates in our culture that says God He's out to stifle your fun. You know, he's slapping all these rules upon you to interfere with your pursuit of the good life. Don't you dare believe that. It's so far from the truth. God wants to give us a tremendous treasure, the riches of his triune life, satisfying our need for love and inner fulfillment by bringing us into intimate relationship with the very source of life and love himself to fill us with his love his life, his peace, his power, himself. What a staggering idea. And how is all of this possible, we may ask? Paul points to the ultimate power play. Now to him who is able to do far, far more than we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work in us. That's how it's sometimes read. But the Greek doesn't allow you to do that. It is strongly emphatic. Some commentator says this is Paul's super superlative words that he's using. It doesn't just say that God can do a lot. God can do more. It says God can do far, far, far more, far more abundantly than we can even think to ask or dare to imagine. What does that do to your prayer life? Paul is saying, in effect, that even if we let our imaginations go hog wild, God's power is even greater than that. That over the power Top, over the top power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power at work in us, filling us, transforming us, enlivening us, exceeding our boldest prayers and our fondest dreams. And perhaps the greatest kudo of all, as great as our God is, as gracious as our God is, we are so deeply cherished and loved by this God that even if we wander away, far away, his powerful love propels him to chase after us and woo us back. We matter that much to God. No wonder 
Paul ends this chapter with a doxology in praise to God. The sheer magnificence, grandeur, goodness of God towards us is indeed beyond all imagining. How can we not fall to our knees with Paul, whether literally or metaphorically, in humble gratitude and unceasing praise before such a God? Come, thou fount of every blessing. Tune our hearts to sing your praise.